What we'll now do is a, is a q and I'm going to ask the panellists firstly a question that is relevant to their business and when we go through that round we'll ask a more general question, get their thoughts. So we're going to start with Patrick. Uh, so Patrick is chairman of Old Mutual that was founded in 1845, is a FTSE 100 company with 19 million customers, 64,000 staff and a big proportion of its business outside the EU. So the question for Patrick I have is, how do you think financial services businesses like Old Mutual's will be impacted if Britain votes to leave the European Union and does leave the Union within two years? Well, <clears throat> we're back to Richard's comment. The FTSE 100 really doesn't represent the UK at all. Uh, we, we're emerging markets driven. Um, and uh, as a consequence, actually, strangely enough, on one measure, with, the, with uh, sterling falling by 10 to 15 percent, if that's how the Bank of England manages to control it, uh, we, we would be a net beneficiary because we report in sterling but we'd have the emerging markets uh, boost. Um, the, the, uh, the reality, however, is, is um, we've been pulling back from Europe in a re restructuring uh, over the last uh, five years. Richard remembers it well. And uh, we are practically out of Europe, mainland Europe, um, for, uh, with all of our businesses. Having said that, we are now the third largest savings uh, and wealth management business in the United Kingdom. We have billions of pounds of uh, our customers' money on, uh, invested via our vehicles. They are mainly invested in uh, the SME sector in the UK, not in European stocks, and not in the FTSE 100. That's how our um, Richard Buxton, for those of you who know him, comes from Schroeder's, and he, uh, he, he brought that philosophy. He now runs all of our, uh, our uh, fund management side. So those billions of pounds invested in the small and medium-sized enterprises in the UK, we believe that the, they will be seriously hit by uh, the reduction in the value of sterling because uh, the cost of doing business will rise significantly for them. Um, they will not have the export opportunities that, uh, that they they'll go uncompetitive almost overnight. And that will have serious implications for people's savings. So it, uh, quite, uh, quite a grim outlook. Having said that, I have to tell you, the board of our subsidiary company, when I was asked to sign the Prime Minister's letter, which I did, but I signed it as Lloyd's, not as Old Mutual, the board were afraid they'd upset the IFAs by saying that they were, they, they, they were in favor of staying in. That's very interesting. Um, Owen, I might move on to you. Um, Devonish's vision is to be world-renowned for its creativity and integrity in the field of agri-technology. So you've got six manufacturing sites across the UK, uh, Ireland, and the US. How do you think, the, what, what will the impact be on British manufacturing businesses if there is a Brexit? Uh, the the um, impact will be adverse. It will be a negative impact. Uh, one of the things to remember about manufacturing is that um, it fundamentally involves the movement of physical goods. Uh, you know, that's a just a standout, distinctive feature of it. So when you listen to the debate, when you consider the issues, uh, the movement of physical goods, and again, for manufacturing, it's, it's frequently forgotten. If you produce 100,000 ton tons of output, that involves moving in 100,000 tons of input. So you're actually dealing with 200,000 tons of physical goods moving in and moving out at that scale. Uh, that will become more difficult. Uh, for difficult, read expensive, uh, read time consuming, and time is money. Uh, one of the reasons I, I feel I can be so clear is that we deal with many markets around the world and uh, we have a hard won huge experience of what it takes to negotiate access, uh, what it takes to get goods out of locations around the world. Uh, and uh, if I could just pick on one word, which has come up several times, and again, as a practical person running a business, uh, hone in on it, and that's the word relationship. Uh, to me, it's the uh, biggest single factor I concentrate on in business, that the relationships are right. And if the relationships are right, you can overcome most things. Um, might take some time, uh, which is an issue. If the relationships are not right, 
Uh, and this seems to be forgotten by many of those campaigning for the UK to leave. Um, it, it, it becomes impossible, no matter what the rules say. Documents get lost, delayed, you go to the back of the queue. And just to uh, pick another word, which is the word experience, uh, I listened to a current serving UK minister last week campaigning for the UK to leave. And one of his motivations, uh, he says, is um, regulation. He wants less regulation. And what did he propose in that debate? Uh, we'll start from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and my reaction to that <clears throat> is, is horror. Yeah. Uh, you know, who has time to start from scratch? Uh, you know, it's, it, 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 is, it is just uh, otherworldly to listen to this stuff and say, you know, this is, this is stop the world, we want to get off time, um, in, in my opinion. That's the real world, thank you. Um, Richard, as it is apparent from the uh, biography I read out earlier, you have a great deal of experience of operating inside the boardrooms of many of the leading companies in Britain um, across a whole lot of sectors. So the question I have for Richard is, how well prepared do you think UK corporates are to deal with a Brexit possibility? I think it's uh, very hard to prepare because the range of outcomes is so variable. And I don't think many people have got in-depth plans for what would ha happen in the event of uh, leaving. and. Uh, the, when Michael Gove said a few weeks ago that uh, the Brexit campaign was now determined that Britain would leave the single market, I think that went further than most of us thought before. And of course the reason for that was intensely political, that if you remain in the single market you have to pay. You have to make a contribution to the European coffers and the European Union and the key there are two key themes of the European exit movement, uh, and that is you save your contribution and you can keep out people. It's immigration. Those are that you can save the money, you can keep people out. And therefore saying that Britain might remain in the single market was, was compromising one of the two key legs of the campaign. And I think that went a lot further um, than British business thought and is, a, is an act of absolute economic suicide. Um, and that has happened only in the last uh, few weeks. So people certainly won't have planned for that. What people will be doing, though, they'll be holding back on investment. That's certainly very evident in the first quarter numbers. And you saw earlier this week um, the land securities, the largest um, REIT in the UK, Real Estate Investment Trust. They took money off the table and went slightly liquid and sold out to some of their properties. And they tend to be a London-centric REIT. Massive organ. I think they got um, 13, 14 billion pounds of, of, of property assets and they got leverage in them. Um, so um, it'll be British business will have prepared, has prepared by being slightly conservative in, in its investment. So it, British business is not ready for this event if it occurs. Okay, well, thank you for that, Richard. We'll, we'll move on from the specific to the more general uh, part of the questions, and I'll start again with, with Patrick. Um, Patrick, you outlined earlier that Britain's membership of the European Union has conferred significant benefits uh, on British citizens over many years and done so in many mm -hmm. ways. And I suppose the concern is that there's a limited appetite within the British electorate to grapple and absorb the complexity of the arguments being made by the Remain campaign. What do you think is the most compelling message or the most compelling way of getting across uh, the right message to influence the vote? Mm. No, um, no, I wish I knew the answer. Um, the, the, uh, the dinner talk party, uh, or, or rather dinner, dinner talk uh, at parties in London at the moment goes, paints a scene like the following. Um, Hillary Clinton is indicted by the FBI for her email scandals. She's forced to step down from the race. Joe Biden is, uh, is uh, co-opted. He loses to Trump. We lose the Brexit vote. Um, Boris Johnson takes over. Um, Marine Le Pen is in, in France. And uh, 
Angela Merkel loses the argument, as you said, uh, on the immigration issues. And the only person that's happy in Europe is Putin. So I, I am not sure where, where it goes. But I would say this, uh, Barry. The, um, the, only, the only argument that seems to resonate with people is to, is to harp back into Britain's history with, uh, with Europe. And Obama used it himself in his speech. And I, I think if you look at the campaign uh, of the Remain campaign and the way the Prime Minister is working this, it is to try and put fear into, into people's minds because it's the same thing that happened with the Scottish referendum, fear that uh, jobs would be lost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think the great, the, the one that uh, certainly from my perspective that I put whenever I'm in those dinner parties is the, is the uh, analysis and... Uh, We'll all know it very well, but Britain has had an army, or England has had an army on the continent in the last one, uh, every hundred years in the last 1,000. Think about that. To keep the peace, to beat the hell out of them, to do whatever they did to them. Um, we had them for 700 years, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think the, uh, the answer is, uh, uh, is, has got to be that when it's all things are considered, Europe has been so good for peace and investment and uh, confidence in the future. And I, how those arguments get across to people, is, 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 I, I'm not too sure. It certainly isn't resonating at the moment. But it is, it is complex, and maybe in the complexity is the difficulty of conveying some simple message that people can absorb. Owen, oh, we'll move on to you for a second question, which is, the Achilles heel of the Leave campaign seems to be the inability to put some, any shape on what life post-Brexit would look like. And we've talked earlier, and Brendan okay. talked in detail about the, the kinds of options there are in terms of arrangements. Um, Michael Gove, as we know, who's a, a key player in the Leave campaign, the Secretary of State for Justice, in a recent unveiling of his vision for the UK's future outside the UK, tellingly remarked that Britain would have the same relationship with the European Union as Bosnia, Albania, and Ukraine, if the country votes for Brexit. And then, as we know, President Obama was in London a couple of weeks ago, and I read a, a comment he made, which I thought was interesting. He says, and on that matter, for example, I think it's fair to say that maybe some point down the line, there might be a UK-US trade agreement, but it's not going to happen anytime soon, because our focus is on getting and negotiating with a big bloc like the European Union and getting a trade deal done, and the UK is going to be at the back of the queue for that. So, Owen, a question for you. How do you think Britain will best preserve its relationship with the European Union and indeed the wider world from your perspective as a, as a manufacturer in the United Kingdom? Well, the, uh, the uh, I hope obvious answer to that uh, is uh, best expressed by uh, a phrase that uh, Remain have used to some extent, uh, which is that Britain should lead, not leave. Um, Considering the alternatives, why, why would you leave? And if I could make two comments which may uh, just uh, hover around that. Um, I, I think the EU actually, and I might be in a minority thinking this, I think it's a great story. But, but great stories have to be told in a great way. You know, you do need to tell people. And one of my observations about this debate is the amount of people who are in favor of the UK remaining, who almost for reasons of politeness seem to refuse to engage in the debate, which astonishes me, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm here. And if I could give you a practical, low-level example, I attended a, an event in Westminster recently um, which considered as you know, run by the British Irish Chamber. The most significant moment in that debate was actually referred to earlier, um, which was the Glastonbury reference. It was the first time I knew that 300,000 people who could vote, who probably were younger, were going to be in Glastonbury and probably wouldn't vote. And the guy who told me this uh, had a solution. He said, uh, I'm going to tell those people, using a social media campaign, how they can vote and be in Glastonbury. Uh, and it's going to cost me £25,000 to do this. And I'm going to ask 25 businesses uh, for £1,000 each uh, to fund that social media campaign. 
And I thought about it while I listened to the debate, and I went back to him and I said, I'll write the cheque for 25,000 uh, to fund your campaign because I think it's a good idea. And I worry that by the time you collect the 25,000 from 25 businesses, the election will be over. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely concerned about this, uh, but, but I think it's all to play for. Uh, and if you're fighting about something important, you need to get out there and tell people what the issues are. Uh, it really isn't a complicated message. Uh, it's, it's a simple message, and it needs to be told simply and well and often by whatever means and methods are available. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a time in the world when methods of communication have never been as available to us. Obama turned the American election on its head by using unconventional methods to communicate a great message to a great number of people for a small amount of money. So that's why I wrote the check. I thought more of that. Just simple, practical things, for God's sake, get out there and do it. Great. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, maybe a final question, Richard, for you with, with the a political view. You mentioned some of the very disruptive political impacts that would arise if Britain leaves the Union. And The Guardian, reporting on Obama's recent visit to London, reported him as arguing that he had a right to respond to the claims of Brexit campaigners that Britain would easily be able to negotiate a fresh trade deal with the US. And he said, they are voicing an opinion about what the United States is going to do. And I figured out you might want to hear from the President of the United States as to what I think the United States is going to do. And the question for you, Richard, is do you think it was appropriate for Obama to intervene in such a public way? And ultimately, when we look back on this, do you think that will be a moment that we will see as one of great significance or one that mattered little? It was entirely appropriate that President Obama made those comments because he was responding to the Brexit campaign's assertion that they'd be in a better position to get a trade deal with the, the United States than the European Union. So he was correcting um, what was a gross misrepresentation of United States policy. Um, his remarks, though, have been received badly actually, in the majority of places, even though it strikes me as self-evident. Even the very sensible Mrs. Pym um, thought that he shouldn't have, uh, <laughs> she sh he, he shouldn't have said it, which we're a little tiff about. Um, but um, people have reacted badly. I think uh, the British react badly to any um, external um, telling what to do. I mean, there's that song, isn't there? No rule Britannia, Britain never ever shall be slaves. You know, anything that sort of alludes to that. People run, run, a, a, run a mile. Um, but I do think it is um, extremely valid that Irish people phone Irish friends and relatives, as the minister said. I think private conversations. I mean, what's the um, IEA logo at the bottom? I wrote it down. Sharing ideas shaping policy. I think you are, in, the citizens of Ireland are entirely in, entitled to um, share their ideas with British friends, so I don't want to in any way put that off, but certainly President Obama standing in what's perceived as a pulpit preaching um, did not, uh, did not uh, do, do well. Um, I would though suggest the one bit of foreign influence that could really swing a really big vote in favour of remaining would be if the French president were to suggest that Britain should leave <laughs> and France would be a ben beneficial. <laughs> that might be a, a tall order, maybe beyond the remit of this, uh, this particular session. Um, one final question and we'll open it to the floor. Um, uh, it's been evident in the last month or so that the Remain campaign has fired a lot of heavy artillery. So you have the IMF, you have Bill Clinton and Jeremy Corbyn coming out, Obama come to London, the Treasury with the um, economic impacts that were mentioned earlier, and last week's pretty outspoken uh, view by the Bank of England, which is pretty unprecedented to uh, raise the spectre of what would happen if it, if it left. So the question for the panel is, is that it, or is this simply the beginning of the heavy bombardment that the British electorate will face 
over the next month. And the last month of heavy artillery is simply the softening up. And now we're going to see a lot more. And do you think that the economic argument is ever going to capture the imagination of the British electorate? Because up to now, all, these, all this artillery is economic or is something else needed to appeal to people who are working in Sheffield or Northampton and are looking, to, struggling to put uh, food on the table. So I'll open that uh, to the panel, anyone who cares to, to dive in there. Um, Richard, can I call yeah. in? Okay. So I think the question is, what could happen in the remainder of, yeah. of the campaign? Yeah. The problem in the Remain campaign is that Cameron oversold his fundamental renegotiation at uh, the beginning. He didn't come back to Britain with that piece of paper which fundamentally changed the um, relationship of Britain with the European Union, even though he did a superb job and got a lot more than most people thought he could come back with. It's really technical. I mean, when Brendan was going through all the, 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 the stages of how the European Union works, People just glaze over in the general population. It's just far too complicated. But Cameron did achieve a lot in those negotiations, but he promised to Joe Public a fundamental renegotiation, and no one believes he got it. So that plank of the campaign, the Remain campaign, has, has gone. Now, I do believe that most people are sensible at the end of the day, and that what's in their wallet and purses will win. And Patrick, you referred to that complete mess up of the, the Treasury estimate of the, um, the loss if Britain were to move outside the uni Union to family income. I think the more that is expressed, the better, and I would really focus on that. Um, but against this, there is that very strong theme of anti immigration, and that isn't anything just to do with the European Union. That's just fundamental of where we are in global politics. It's the Trump factor, it's the Mademoiselle Le Pen, it's the, 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 the hugely right-wing parties in Germany, Netherlands and Sweden and that, that are emerging. It is a much more general theme that here is captured in leaving the European Union. And that is very difficult to fight against because it is a visceral feeling of people against people arriving in their street who they don't know and they are unfamiliar with. It's that fear that my job might go to someone. And it's just the globalization of trade. The fact is, Britain has benefited hugely from immigration. And the, indeed, the country has been formed by waves of immigration, um, mainly from Europe. I always point out that this rather unusually shaped nose is the shows of the Roman occupation which ended in 411. <laughs> um, you know, I'm demonstrated by appearance of some sort of Saxon origin. You know, Britons come from Europe, but somehow we see ourselves as, as separate. And Patrick talked about the dinner party conversations of how Britain, its relationship with Europe has been putting armies onto the continent, but then always withdrawing. So Britain has seen itself moving onto the continent, fixing stuff that's broken, and then returning home into <coughs> Fortress Britannia. And it doesn't, hasn't grasped the benefit of being inside the European Union as the one people we all are. And I think that's very difficult to sell, but I would really concentrate on the wallet and purse. And President Hollande. So what, they're do what they're, so, so what they're doing is uh, what the Remain campaign has planned. It's, it's to Owen's point. Uh, business has got to get behind this. Airbus, for obvious reasons, came out about a month ago, wrote to all their staff and said, you know, our, our view is your jobs are at risk if, we're, if uh, Britain is, uh, is out. You can see that in Bristol. They, they would lose the uh, wing production for the Airbus. Um, and we have to do it. Uh, I, I spoke to the CEO of our wealth business yesterday, and I said to him, I'm going to be asked to sign another prime minister's letter. They want 60 chairman of FTSE 100 companies to, 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 uh, to do it. Um, I said, what do you think? He said, well, I've, I'm in favor of it, uh, but you'll have to persuade the board. I said, well, just tell the board we're doing it. I think we, we, um, we have to, business has to come out, and there will be the fear factor. 
And just uh, the say all politics is local, uh, just to take the point, um, I'm writing to all my staff next week, uh, laying out the argument in simple, straightforward terms. People tell me I shouldn't do it, I'm doing it. I'm encouraging my suppliers to do it, uh, companies in my sector to do it. Um, and then on a wider note, um, I take the point made earlier, um, turnout is really important. Uh, so you tell people that, uh, and I think you use every one of those 35 days at every level. Uh, you know, the, this, is, this is now, the way I see the 35 days, it's now become a home game. And the home game will be won or lost by the home team. And uh, they, they need to get out on the pitch uh, <coughs> and play uh, as if their lives depend on it. And uh, uh, there's a thing out there called the silent majority. And I actually believe in the silent majority. And I believe they're the majority. And I believe they're very silent. But like previous speakers, I believe they're far from fools. And if the argument is put out properly and well, uh, I think the silent majority will prevail on this one. So it's up to us. Thank you very much. Um, so it's now time to uh, open the floor to questions. So I'll start with this man here who's got his hand up straight away. Uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, I'm currently based in, in London at the moment, co-founder of Esperanza Productions and a filmmaker, and I'm absolutely thrilled to inform you all, I do have a vote in this referendum, I'm registered to vote, and after listening to Brendan's chilling but masterful lecture, I can assure you I'll be doing so with immense uh, enthusiasm and pleasure. But the one question I really want to ask the panel, because I was at a meeting in Chatham House on Monday night when Grayling, the leader of the House of Commons and uh, <coughs> member of the Cabinet, said that after Brexit, when, the Europe when Britain leaves the European Union, nothing will change or need change in relation to the single market. It's talking as if the United Kingdom was the United States, a major superpower, totally detached from reality. Well, naturally enough, I leapt to my feet and pointed out to him when I got a chance, because it was a packed meeting, I can tell you, uh, and point out that that's not going to be the situation in Ireland because of the border north and south, between north and south. And we have moved from a militarised border to no border in the space of a generation. Now, obviously, the Irish and British governments in advancing the peace process played a huge part in that. But obviously, the European Union, as we're all aware, facilitated that because we have the same system, effectively, both sides economically for that reason. But the question I want to ask, because I'm virtually hoarse talking to friends, relations, and everybody I know in Britain about the need to face up to the risks involved... I have to say, why is business so reticent? I cannot understand that because yeah. of the interests. And I commend Owen Brennan for his quick initiative because he is absolutely right. If he had not acted, that initiative would not have happened. The reticence, I just cannot understand it because the point was well made uh, by Richard Pym that obviously you know, people are affected by their... Uh, uh, you know, their own interests. Because I saw in an interview on BBC the other night where one couple who clearly were thinking of voting for Brexit after an announcement about the impact on house prices, they said, well, of course, we will have to think about that. Now, when people are confronted by the reality, but who best to confront them with that reality than business? And I still cannot understand that, re that reticence, even amongst the city of London. You know, as the points were well made, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. 80% of EU foreign exchange business, 85% of, of hedge fund assets, half the fund management business, 10% of the UK economy, and 11% of tax revenue. I had to learn that off because I have regular arguments with people in the city, by the way. But, yeah, and they, some of them, believe it or not, are actually in favour of Brexit. So just that question. Please explain to me, if you can, why business is so reticent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any takers on the reticence, which I think is apparent of some business? Ryanair is obviously quite a different example. And, uh, has come out very strongly in favour of campaigning. But Richard, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very simple that businesses <clears throat> don't like to alienate their customers. And if 50% of your customers are for Brexit, you don't want to take a political stance. <coughs> and you know that, let's just say, it's a major food retailer. You've got 50% of the people coming through your doors are for Brexit. Why would you say we as a firm are to remain? And also, if people do come out, then they are rounded on by the Leave campaign. They are outed. Um, so, you know, it's, you know the, the tar and the, back, the bad stuff are applied to them. Um, and um, you know, there are adverse business implications immediately. You know, people try to send messages to their staff, but normally 
Those then appear in a newspaper, and the black stuff gets applied to them again. So, you know, I can do it because I'm in Ireland. I'd find it very difficult to be quite so public if it was a British firm, as Patrick has found with his own board. Yeah, I, I think I think when you look at the uh, when you look at the um, uh, development of the reasons we are where we are, it it's a self-inflicted wound. Remember that uh, that uh, Cameron um, put it in the manifesto, never expecting to be the the uh, a majority government. So he thought it would die, um, and it was a way of controlling his own right wing and the UKIP uh, group. However, he's now hoisted with his own petard, and uh, um, people are saying, well, you got us here. You get us out. Uh, Lorcan Blake is my name, uh, Chairman. Uh, I want to give an honest view on this. I, I think the debate um, so far is too much at a high level, big ticket level. It's chief executives speaking to chief executives. But the big vote is on the ground with the ordinary working class people. And I think that for this debate to be won, it has to be brought down to that level, as Richard Pym mentioned there, about what's left in the pocket or what's taken from the pocket. Like, the people who are putting up the case to leave uh, in Northern Ireland, for example, will get six billion back and we give you three billion more on what you've got there. We've got to take the debate down to that level so that the man on the street knows uh, what's coming and what's not coming around, say, employment law, around equality law and what's in the pocket. And that's not coming through. Thank you. Uh, lady here in the fourth row from the back. Thank you very much. Um, Rowena Dwyer from the Irish Farmers Association. My question, bizarrely enough, isn't going to be about agriculture because I think it is so self-evident for our sector, the negative impact from a potential Brexit on trade, on employment, on income, on animal health issues. It is... Uh, we are so strongly, uh, our, our strong belief in terms of the, the, the negative outcome. Now, my question, actually, gentlemen, you were asking about what will have an impact. And it so happens last week, I got to catch Harriet Harman's intervention in relation to the role the EU has had on women's rights in the workplace. I thought she was brilliant, I have to say. And I just wanted to know, was there a feeling that that intervention had had an impact? And could more along those lines be what might persuade people of the benefits of staying within the European Union? Thank you. Thank you. Owen, do you want to take that question? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, I have watched and participated in quite a lot of debates. I agree with the previous speaker in terms of, uh, you know, in a way, in these sort of discussions, you end up talking to yourself. You need to get out there and talk to the people who are actually going to make this happen one way or the other. Uh, so a huge issue is getting people out to vote, and they'll do that if they see it as being important in their interest and in their children's interest, and they need to be told. So what Harry, every debate I've seen of that level, where the facts have been spun out, uh, I think is affecting that silent majority. It's just a point of view I have. Um, you know, we'll find out on the 23rd of June. But I have seen the sort of changes you're describing when the facts have been put out. And an interesting thing I observe, when the leave side are engaged with, in general, I have found them to become their own worst enemies. I attended a debate, for example, in Oxford, Phil Hogan, Owen Patterson. Phil Hogan showed his caliber in that debate by letting Owen Patterson, in my opinion, do a lot of talking. And the more talking he did, the worst case he made for the EU to leave. Now, I was surrounded by people who want to leave, and they weren't exactly telling me at lunch that this had changed their mind, but you could see it in their body language that they had been adversely affected by what they'd seen Owen Patterson do. They're making bad arguments, and the more they're engaged with, the more that's drawn out. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a few more questions. I'm conscious that we are slightly running over our schedule, so I have people waving at me frantically, but we'll finish soon enough. But this gentleman here, and we'll take one or two more questions. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman. Blair Horn, a member of the Institute. Uh, I mean, I agree that Brexit is a real possibility, but I'm still not inclined to, re to, to uh, rule out the Remain side. I mean, 
There's a conundrum in the Treasury report that I think could be important, and it's in relation to tariff policy uh, on food prices. Yeah. Brendan Halligan earlier mentioned Rhys Mogg's article in the Financial Times this week about the divisions in the Conservative Party. The divisions were over tariff policy, uh, lost the 1906 election, the 1923 election, essentially over food prices. And food prices was a big factor as well in the 1975 election. Uh, we, you know, Britain did not do the green pound revaluations uh, that, that we did for, uh, for that very reason. Now, if the Brexiters talk about trading on WTO rules, which they seem to accept now, well, that means that unless Britain unilaterally uh, rules out tariffs on food, which case it has to give the same unilateral tariff to every other country, well, then you're talking about massive tariffs on food uh, being imported into Britain. 36% on dairy products, up to 70% on beef, 15% on fruit and vegetables. So in the medium term, there's going to be a huge increase in food prices until eventually it can negotiate free trade deals with other countries. I think that will feature in the election before, in the referendum campaign in the near future. And I'd just like to, if it does, can that be a factor for the Remain side? And I'll tell you what the Brexit uh, response to that, because I've heard that argument put, and their response is that uh, the um, European Union is an agricultural cartel designed to protect French farmers. There are cheaper, there's cheaper food available on the... This is not me, by the way. It's not me. Right? <laughs> believe, believe me. That there is cheaper food available on the world market and that by going to the WTO tariffs, we are able to access cheaper food in the rest of the world. Sounds compelling. In the long term, but not in the medium term. I'm, I'm not here to expand on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll, a couple of questions maybe from this side. Uh, there's a gentleman here first, and then we'll take the, the woman beside him. Thanks very much. Um, Keith Stevens from Accenture in the financial services practice. Um, one question I have, or I suppose one feeling I have, is complete deja vu. Um, seven years ago, we had the Lisbon, Lisbon one, and I attended conferences like this. And my question is, how likely to the panel is a second referendum here? Um, sat through Brendan's speech, or Brendan's talk, and it was very, very good. But the sense that I get here is that um, the Leave side are setting the agenda, and that is exactly what happened in Ireland. And it's only it's only when the Remain side set the agenda that we will start to win. Because there's an old um, phrase, and it's very, very relevant, that when you're explaining, you're losing. Mm. And what I see here is that we, as business people, are explaining. Like we had Boris Johnson during the week making an absolute outlandish claim. What was the um, reasoning behind it? To me, it was to take the debate away from the economic agenda. And the closer the Remain side can stay to talking about economics, food prices, house prices, things that affect the money in your pocket. That's what wins elections. We're not trying to, it, it, this is a, it's a business problem, but it's a political solution. And in order to win this, we have to be as enthused as any team is out there that wins, because at the minute, mm. it seems to me that the fight, um, like the real, um, let's say the fight and the dog is greater within the leave side at the moment, rather than the remain. So um, that's the comment, but the, the question is, um, how likely do we see um, the possibility of a second referendum. Thanks for your time. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Maybe well, well the, the, the simple answer is uh, um, most observers would say highly unlikely. Um, and uh, the reason refers back to Brendan's point. Nobody knows what happens once we vote to go on the 24th of June um, and who will be running the country. So nobody's willing to stand up there and say, except the Prime Minister, obviously. He says, we're going to stay and therefore the, this is it. And uh, we're the Conservative Party is not going to do, uh, open itself up again. British politics is in disarray. The Labour Party is completely uh, dead in the water. The uh, SNP, thankfully, are for staying. But they're a force in, in Westminster. Uh, you'll have seen them at the, if, if you watched the Queen's speech yesterday. Uh, they have more say now than the Labour Party. And yet they are not a force south of the border in terms of people's, how people vote. Uh, so it's, it, it is extraordinarily difficult to call. I think we'll take a final question from this person here. Hi, um, uh, Jean Hoey from BT. Um, my question is really about the devolved regions, just your views on a potential second independence referendum in Scotland, should um, the UK vote to leave and Scotland vote to remain? 
Well, in the recent um, local elections in the United Kingdom, the Scottish Nationalists lost their majority in the Scottish Parliament. And they seem to be stepping back from a second referendum um, because um, they might not win it. Um, I think it will be determined solely by the vote on the day that if Scotland votes hugely to remain in the EU and England votes to leave, that could resuscitate it, just arithmetically. But at the moment, it seems to have gone down the, um, the Scottish National Party priority. That's my reading of the situation. OK, I'm conscious that we have um, overstayed our welcome. I'd like to conclude... Um, but just mentioning the, 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 the bookmaker odds, and I'm a close follower of Paddy Power, it was four to one against that uh, Britain would leave the European Union in, in January. It's now 11 to four, and it hasn't moved much in the last while, but it's uh, an unbackable four to one on to, to remain. And now, I think someone said the bookies got it wrong last year too, but these camp, the, 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 the polls we're seeing are really hard to tell which way uh, it's going to go. Um, I would like to thank the panel. I think we've had a very interesting uh, presentation. We've a very interesting Q&A, and uh, they've put a lot of effort into thinking about what might be said. And I think their experience came to bear today. And thank you all for listening and appreciate the questions. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.